What's up, guys? Brian here, coming at you with episode seven of The Young Startup. Today, we get to interview Kian. Kian is a former ex-NFL player, someone that was going to play for Kansas City. Before he stepped onto the field, he was broken with the terrible news that no athlete wants to hear. He's unable to play due to a medical condition. Now, today, we go into a ton of depth in regards to finding who you are, who your true self is, and aligning yourself with what truly matters to yourself. Super stoked for this information. It's a ton, a ton of value. So stay tuned. I hope you guys enjoy. Alrighty, welcome back to the Young Startup. Today we have a special, special guest. Uh, his name is Kian, very unique name. We're excited to have him here. Uh, he's done a lot of podcasts and every time I listen to him, I get inspired um, in some way or another. I learned something new from him. Uh, so again, thanks for coming on, Kian. Um, before we jump into things, of course, we want to get you to do a little bit of an introduction for us, um, a little bit about yourself, but also your story, because it's, it's a crazy one to hear. Uh, I'm excited for our audience to uh, tune into this. So um, yeah, let's go with it. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm excited to be here. So thank you for creating a space for some epic, legendary information and wisdom to be dropped on this call. So thank you guys for creating the space. Uh, my story, I'm from Sioux Falls, South Dakota, man, a spot that a lot of, not a lot of people are familiar with. And uh, as you can imagine, being a small town in the Midwest, the, the likelihood of being able to achieve lifelong dreams of getting out of that space, is not something that happens very often. And I had the opportunity to achieve a lifelong dream of mine, which is making it to the NFL. I got all the way there, ended up having a condition where uh, that got exposed that was much worse than I initially anticipated and ended up getting my career cut short by never, ever being able to step on the game field. So shortly after that, I uh, made my way into the opposite sort of, of what I went to school for, <laughs> which was to be a financial analyst. I thought I was going to take that route, but... I quickly, after football got done, said, absolutely not. I will not sit in an office and I'm going to do something different. And the first thing that came to me uh, to be able to be in a position to be able to spread uh, a lot of uh, wisdom that I felt like I had was jumping into being a personal trainer. So I jumped in, started being a personal trainer in South Dakota and uh, eventually moved to Miami, Florida, where I had a ton of incredible uh, unique, wild, crazy experiences. Anybody knows anything about Miami listening to this, they'll be able to have some idea of what that means, uh, which was incredible for me, but also was the place where my first program that I established for people with autoimmune conditions was born. So I became the go-to person. Uh, I would say in my gym in the area in Miami, I was at for everything internal health related. I quickly, after about little under 10 months, at Equinox in Miami, quit my job as a personal trainer and scaled a product of mine for people with autoimmune conditions and digestive disorders and went all in on that and realized that many of the clients that I had in that space actually had something much deeper going on within them than just the physical part of their body, but something more at the mental emotional level that they were experiencing that was causing the physical disruptions that they were trying mm -hmm. to gain um, better health surrounding. Uh, after being in the entrepreneur space for a little while doing that, I was surrounded by a lot of entrepreneurs. And I also went much deeper into my own, uh, if you want to say, spiritual journey for myself, uh, why I am the way I am, where the things that I do come from, uh, and resolving a lot of internal conflict that I had inside of me. And found that a lot of my friends who were also very much at what I would consider high achievers, people that uh, whatever we touch seems to find a way to turn to gold in some way. <laughs> I love and, that. Uh, right? And so, so within that context, though, in that frame, it's easy for us high achievers to lose sight of our own well-being in the process of pursuing whatever it is that we would like to achieve. And through a lot of my own personal experience of, of internal healing that I've done, I, I became, I would say, the go-to dude now for high achievers with being able to do the same uh, with them. And that's a space that I'm just so fucking lit up about. And I've been doing that for about two and a half years now. And uh, I've, I've never been deeper into it. And I, I've never had as much fun as I'm having with it 
I love that. That's awesome. Crazy story. You've been just about everywhere and just, oh man, like I, I can't even ex- think to explain what you were going through when you got the news that you couldn't play. Um, I'm curious, like, how did that feel? How, how were you in the moment? How did you handle that? Um, Cause that's like childhood dream making it and then just getting crushed. You know what I mean? That's, that's tough. <laughs> yeah. Cer- certainly. Uh, and it, <laughs> it was all within 24 hours too. I remember literally I got the call from my agent, was flown out to Kansas City about three hours later. And then the next day uh, I was told that I'd never be able to play again. So it was all just quickly like super high and then boom, really big low. And that low, oh my gosh, you know, I was sitting in the hotel room when uh, the general manager of Kansas City called me and delivered me the news. And uh, man, I put the phone down and I was, I was so confused. I was so hurt. Um, frustration, uh, a lot of sadness and just mm-hmm. fucking bald, just bald and cried. Yeah. And, um, as you, as you can imagine, you said, since I was in third grade, that was what I said that I was going to do. And after that, about an hour and a half of me just crying, uh, I'm like, all right, well, I, I kind of want to go somewhere and do something. And I decided to go get a cheeseburger, uh, <laughs> with no restrictions on anything that I ate and just ate it so casually. And, and to be honest with you guys, uh, there was actually a sense of relief that was there. Uh, there wasn't all this extra pressure of having to eat a certain way or do a certain thing to be prepared to be able to put my body into the gladiator's ring, right? So there was a level of relief that came after a lot of the hurt, which I found very interesting at the time, uh, mm-hmm. which makes sense looking back. Uh, on the amount of pressure that I probably put on myself to, to get to that space. And uh, then I then went home and uh, as anybody that uh, likes to suppress some deep rooted hurt, I'm a very good at quickly pivoting. And uh, I, I didn't necessarily give myself maybe a lot of time to, to sit in some of the feelings and process a lot of it mm-hmm. uh, because I am somebody that, uh, by nature is very good at pivoting and, and changing direction and being very, very good in, in the face of change. Uh, I didn't allow myself to maybe process as much as I could have, but nevertheless, I pivoted relatively quickly and moved on to what I felt was next with the, the personal training uh, extravaganza. Cool. Cool, man. That's crazy. Um, in terms of pivoting, that's a really good topic, obviously, especially with entrepreneurs, people that are busy, that always got things going on. Um, is that something that was just like natural to you or like, is that something you developed or, or where did this pivoting skill set come from you? Cause I feel like there's a lot of people that do have troubles with that, especially people that are getting started. Um, they get knocked down and they just don't know where to go. Yeah. And, and, and honestly, I don't think there's, there's anything else to look at than self-confidence and self-belief. I really like at the end of the day, our capacity to be able to, to pivot in the face of change uh, all comes down to self-belief really. And I could probably give some credit to me being the oldest of four kids, which the oldest tends to be sometimes the most independent yeah. uh, as far as being self-sustainable. So I give some credit to that. Uh, but also I would say my, I, my parents were, were incredible people. My dad was somebody that, uh, I mean, went into huge debt to fund his, his dream and then ended up coming out on, on top. So I was able to see firsthand from, from my dad of him pursuing what he wanted and, and not always getting what he ultimately wanted, but ended up uh, keep going down that path. So I was always encouraged to, to really step into what I wanted. Mm-hmm. And I think through the process of me going through that whole entire experience of getting all the way to the NFL, uh, there was a certain sense of like, damn, like I can do whatever the fuck I want. Like I just made it to the NFL. Like, yeah, yeah let's go. <laughs> So I, I believe through that experience as well of getting to that place uh, that really lit a fire inside of me. It's like, Hey, uh, if I decide to go somewhere else, I can make it happen. Oh yeah. Cool, man. That's, that's, that's crazy. That's crazy. Let's, let's chat a little bit further around the self-belief. So awesome. It's awesome that, you know, you developed that um, from family values is what it seems like developing, developing it. 
um, throughout your life. But in regards to someone, like, let's say someone went through a very, very similar experience. So something like, you know, they achieved their life dreams, but they didn't have that self-belief instilled into them, something like that you didn't have. What kind of advice could you give to them in order to develop that, in order to do that pivoting just like you did? Mm. That's <laughs> an incredible question. And, and, and a lot of people that, that, that isn't a lot of people because not a lot of people are able to get to that place of being yeah. able to say that they've accomplished their life on dream. So most of the time it's people that are in the pursuit of it. So anybody that does get to that point mm -hmm. realizes that this isn't going to bring me the level of fulfillment that I thought it would, right? Which normally ends up leading down a path of uh, trying to pivot quickly and create more success to mask the lack of feeling good for having that certain achievement mm -hmm. um, or it pivots into a different direction where somebody goes somewhere else and thinks that something else is going to bring them the fulfillment that they're looking for in a completely different area. So I would, I would, I would like to address the people that are in the pursuit of whatever it is that they'd like to achieve. Uh, I feel like that probably gets to a large demographic of people. Absolutely. And I want to say that, Nothing that we ever do or accomplish is ever going to bring us the fulfillment that we're looking for. Okay. So if we knew that, if, if that's that was something that we knew as fact, how would somebody best go about pursuing what they want? Well, I'm not the first person that said this, but ultimately it's not the action that we're looking for. It's the feeling that we get from accomplishing the thing that we have set out for ourselves. Right. So what would be the logical move? Well, let me find a way to be able to align with the emotion that I'm looking to get from the thing that I'm trying to achieve, right? So yeah. looking at whatever it is that we'd like to achieve and saying, okay, well, what is the emotion that this thing is going to deliver me when I get it? Okay. Is it going to give me a sense of inner peace? Is it going to give me a sense of, of freedom? Is it going to give me a sense of permission to, to uh, step into being who I really, really want to be? Uh, so really tapping into that feeling of what it is that I'm looking to achieve from the thing that I have set out for myself. Okay. So after we do that, the next thing is, well, how do I align with the emotion that I'm looking to get from the thing that I'm, that I'm chasing? That's the million dollar question. Mm -hmm. And now a lot of people try to do that through different forms of, of meditation. They do it through uh, trying to um, use affirmations and um, conscious uh, gratitude to be able to get into that state. But the problem with that is that we're able to get to that place. We're able to Tony Robbins hype ourselves up, uh, but that's not sustainable, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like this pump up, pump up, pump up, pump up. And the best way I like to describe it is like, you're, it's like you're revving the car. It's like, eh, 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 eh. and you get the car going <laughs> and it's running, right? You go to, you go to put, take it out of the, the driveway and you start to drive then, Da, da, da. Right. And then that just shuts down. Right? Mm -hmm. right. That's how most people operate. Right. And it's really, really frustrating for a lot of the people out there that are aware of this concept of being able to align with emotion, but continually be plagued by those feelings of doubt and insecurity. Right. After the, the, the temporary emotion of getting ourselves hyped up into this heightened state disappears. Right. So then the question becomes, well, how do I get myself to the place where I'm able to embody this emotion without having to trying to consciously uh, embody it through mm -hmm. using excessive gratitude practices and and um, excessive meditations and all this kind of stuff to try to get myself hyped to be in that place. Right. And that's where a lot of the work that, that I've historically previously done through different deep, deep emotional uh, cleansing uh, practices that I've gone through that allows me to begin to actually embody that at a high level without trying to consciously do it. Right? And that's where the work that I do now for high level entrepreneurs and business owners comes into play because most people that get to me, they've, they've done all the meditations. They've listened to all the Tony Robbins. They've listened to all the podcasts. <laughs> they've read all the books and they're like, dude, I still feel this doubt. I still feel these insecurities. Why is this still happening? I, and that's where I, that's where I come into play. <clears throat> that's amazing. And, and the reason I say that is because 
I feel like I'm kind of in that position right now, to be completely yeah. frank with you. I'm, I, and Eric is probably thinking exactly the same thing. We were, <laughs> great with routine. we're great with routine. Like every single morning we're meditating, every single night we're meditating, you know, we're practicing gratitude. We're, we're saying affirmations mm-hmm. out, li- out, out loud, but you know, all said and done, there's still always that, you know, mixed emotion of not actually fulfilling that and not actually getting into that state that we want to get. And it's just this constant like wheel. It's like we're running in this hamster wheel and it helps by all means, but I feel like it's not sustained every single day. You know what I mean? So if, if I were to ask you this, what kind of advice would you give to me? Like <laughs> considering I'm feeling this, what kind of advice could, could you give to me that I could implement and take action on almost right away in order to make that change and obviously it's going to take time, just like everything, just like building every single habit. But if I were to do something just out of this call, what, what would that one thing be? In the course of when I was speaking, was there anything that was coming up, Brian, for you that was like, okay, this, I re- really, really resonate with this part of it. Or is there any kind of uh, other form of communication coming through you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The one thing that I'll state is like, <clears throat> and I've, I've talked to myself about this often, but it's more so like, I feel like I'm doing, I'm do, I feel like I'm doing things like these habits, like the meditation and things out of almost like compliance. Cause I know that it can get me somewhere, but it's almost like, yes, I've, I've experienced benefits from it. But at the same time, I feel like I'm still missing the mark on a lot of it. So, like I said, the biggest thing that came up was more so the fact that, um, and I have a reminder almost every single day, every single morning, I have a reminder that comes up to do self mastery and not be compliant with it. But I still kind of fall off that track and I feel like I'm just doing it and I'm rushing through it. I'm not really diving deep into it. You know what I mean? That's what, that's what came up when you got, when you brought that up. And that's the reason why I, I kind of, uh, asked you that question in the first place. So how does it feel when that pops up on your phone? Kind of like in a way, like a, a, a nuisance. You know what I mean? Like it pops up and, you know, it reminds me by all means, but then, you know, I put my phone down and I almost forget about it. You know what I mean? So I guess the idea of it in the first place was to make sure that I, I am aware to keep myself, you know, present and I'm, I'm following the things, but I definitely fall off that, that bandwagon almost instantly now that I think of it. So do you think that's beneficial for you to have that continually popping up? Because to me, it sounds like it would eventually lead to some form of resentment if resentment isn't already present in that space. Yeah, I agree with that, honestly. It probably, right. yeah. yeah, I don't think it, you know, it isn't too beneficial now that I think of it. Yeah, and, and that's where it can be really difficult for a lot of people. And, and you in particular, keeping it about you here, Brian, um, is that, when we do things out of necessity or feeling like we're obligated to, whether that's for other people or even for ourselves, it will always eventually lead to that nice little R word of resentment. Okay. So the most powerful thing that we can do, especially I'm sure someone like you and Eric, where you've had some experience in the personal development space is being able to, start to tap into you now, independent of what everybody else is telling you, you know, Gary Vee over on, on the video that morning is telling you to do, right? And being able to really trust that whatever inspiration comes through you mm-hmm. in regard to these things that get you into a heightened state will be the things that are going to be best for you to lead to the greatest outcome. Now, I'm going to give you an example of that for me personally. Absolutely. I wake up whenever I want. And one of the best things that gets me in a great mood in the morning is me waking up and going to get my SIE from the downstairs market and going and sitting outside on the balcony and singing to whatever music that I want to listen to. I love okay. that. And that, that might be all I do, right? And then I jump into a coaching call, okay? But because there's this idea that there's all these other experts that know what is best for me. We end up doing things that aren't necessarily best for ourselves, which eventually leads to what? Like I said, resentment. Okay. So now that you guys both have had a lot of experience in this space of knowing things that are good for, for priming you or getting you into, into a peak state, 
Now it's time to be able to say, okay, all right, I see all of this. What are the things that align with me best? Okay, well, with me waking up at 5 a.m. or 6 a.m., does that, does that actually serve my greatest good for me to be the most productive? Or is me waking up at 8 o'clock best for that? Right. Now, I, I don't, like I said, I don't set an alarm and I wake up whenever the fuck I want, right? And, and, and that's the space that I'm in because that's what puts me in the best state. For me, personal freedom is one of the most powerful things. Mm-hmm. So anybody telling me that I have to do anything, uh, I, I don't like, right? So that's why I go off my schedule. And, and two, I'm a little different. Though. I don't play by the rules either. I, I create my own rules, right? And that's the place I'd like to get everybody that I work with to is no longer having to operate in this place of doing things out of obligation for other people, mm-hmm. right? And even obligation for ourselves. I mean, what does that require? That requires one of the most vulnerable things that we can possibly do, right? It's, it's going deep inside of ourselves and asking ourselves what we want. Right? And here's why that's vulnerable. Because if it doesn't work out, that causes us to question our entire existence, right? At least when I, when I do things that other people tell me to do, or if I'm doing it for other people, then it's not really me. Mm -hmm. right it takes away a level of vulnerability okay so it is a very vulnerable thing to make it about ourselves uh, but it's the next right thing in the process after personal development and being able to tap into this deep place of knowing within ourselves right And, and what is the byproduct of that the byproduct of that is a lot more ease a lot more smoothness in our life and what does everybody want more effortless money like that's one of the, the, the best parts of the process of, of tapping into the self, because the more we do that, and the more we, we tap into ourselves and ask ourselves, what it is that we want in these certain circumstances and situations, we're able to act accordingly. It creates a real level of confidence, right? But when we do it for external means, it's not for ourselves. So it doesn't really build confidence. Okay. So the best way I like to describe most people's relationship, even high achievers, regardless of how they're perceived to everybody else, they're, they're, our relationship with ourselves is like a beaten down little orphan that's never been shown any love, right? Yeah. Because we're, we're getting so good at learning how other people best respond to situations and we become whatever we have to become to be able to, to be that without actually checking in with ourselves. So that voice inside of ourselves is, is like a little orphan that doesn't have any confidence, right? But the more we allow ourselves to tap into that place of, okay, how, how do I want to start my morning? What, what, what do I like to do? What just like, what just feels good to me? Independent of, of any kind of uh, uh, achievement or, or thing that I feel like I should do that gets me into this place of, of getting locked in the zone. What is it? All right. And at first it might be a little vulnerable and might be difficult, mm-hmm. right? but one or two things may come from that. If mm-hmm. we allow ourselves to step into that place of following through with that and applying it, there will begin to be that increase in the confidence from that little orphan. Right. And as time goes on, the more more intrinsic momentum we build inside of ourselves and confidence we build. Right. And then all of our confidence comes from this internal place of validation where we're not really no longer we're no longer concerned with the external view of of what's happening going on with ourselves. Right? And that's one of the biggest hurdles that people have right? is being able to completely disregard everything out here and say, hold on, what am I what am I doing? What do I want to do? That was amazing that was incredible and it totally it totally resonates with me and it really makes me second guess myself honestly yeah (laughs) it makes me second guess exactly like you said you know i've i've developed routine i've developed habits through you know what's working for other people but that not that isn't necessarily what makes me happy actually yesterday to put this into perspective for you i've always been one to set an alarm get up yesterday I woke up with no alarm and I probably had the best day I've ever had alone yesterday. And that would make, that's what made me happy for sure. You know what I mean? So I feel like I'm missing the mark there. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. That was phenomenal. That was super powerful. Thank you. Yeah. And man, a a lot of it's, a lot of it's permission, man. A lot of it's permission too, right? We've got this conditioning, this fucking personal development community conditioning of this is what you have to do to be successful. Right. And, and I don't operate on that frequency. I don't operate on that frequency. I operate in a completely different frequency. And it's a frequency of grace. Right? It's a frequency of grace, man. I don't, I, I've gotten to a space where I've taken away a lot of the contingencies that I have of myself to be able to feel certain things. Mm-hmm. Right? And that's what a lot of us do. 
as long as I do this, as long as I achieve this, as long as I make this person feel this way, right? as long as I, I do my dot, 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 then I can feel this way. Right. right? Yeah. And, and, and the more we operate more in that place when most of our motivation is from this external place. Where okay. we want it to be more internal. Yep. It, it, it's all about moving into this internal space. But here's the scary part is that most of us don't really know ourselves that well mm-hmm. because we've operated most of our lives in that space and doing what we feel like we need to do to get the success that we want, get the recognition that we want, to have the relationships that we think that we want, right? But we never really check in and know ourselves. And that can be a very scary process, mm-hmm. right? Because it causes us to have to confront some of the, the deep, deep stuff that a lot of times we don't want to confront, right? Yeah. But I can tell anybody firsthand, it's, it's the most beautiful, rewarding process anybody can uh, embark on. And uh, I think there's a reason why all my closest friends are some of my best clients, uh, because they've seen it firsthand uh, what can happen when we learn to be able to truly make it about ourselves and not make it about making sure uh, we fit a certain mold mm-hmm. or we make other people feel a certain way. Wow. I love that. I love I'm that. Like awe. I don't even, I don't even know what to say. <laughs> yeah, it's literally. Like, it's well, one thing that, one thing that you mentioned was contingencies. So, you know, stepping away from, you know, doing this is going to equal that. Um, I'm curious to know that process. You know what I mean? Like, how can I, I, I obviously know, like now that I'm just reflecting back on my day to day, there's obviously contingencies in place where, you know, if I do this, I'll do that. But how can I go about identifying that um, in a deeper state? And, and how can I essentially d- disassociate myself with that contingency uh, at a higher level? It's mm, a very deep question. Yeah. <laughs> How can I disassociate from that contingency at a higher level? Well, if you're doing it on your own, I suppose one of the things that I would say is being able to identify first what those contingencies are. Because I feel like a lot of us aren't even aware of these secret hidden contracts that we have with ourselves. Yeah. Right. That say either I do this or I won't get to feel this way. So really identifying some of these hidden contracts that we have in our lives. Right? And, and I can say, Sometimes it's difficult to be able to find or identify, Mm -hmm. but resentment can lead us to the path of finding where those contracts are at. So what do I mean by that? Well, there's some people that I work with that end up developing resentment towards their wives. Okay. There's some resentment there. Why? Because they do all they can to make sure that their wife feels good and they do everything in their capacity to do so. But for some reason, they fall short of the mark, right? And so because they put that pressure on themselves to have to be this thing for their wife and their wife isn't allowing them to fully be into the place of knowing what they're doing is working, Mm -hmm. there's resentment towards her because she's not fulfilling what the person thinks that she should be doing based off the guy's level of effort, okay? Does that make Mm -hmm. sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. So what all, another very common one is the business, right? A lot of people that I work with begin to start to develop resentment towards their business because of expectations that they have of themselves to perform in a certain way, right? So following the breadcrumbs of resentment of where, where I'm, I'm, I'm experiencing frustration or anger towards can lead to finding some of these uh, contracts that we have with ourselves. Mm-hmm. Love that. I love that. Do you typically, I, I got a good question here w- when it comes to resentment. So for example, you give the scenario about business, how do, how do like in a typical scenario with your clients, how do typical like people typically handle that? Do they go and try to fix something with that business or do they like change the habits that they're doing or the routine that they're doing with that business? Or do they walk away from it? Like what's the typical way that people take this resentment and make it in a place where it's no longer that feeling of resentment? Well, most, most resentment comes from a place of overgiving in some way too, right? So most of the time there's an element of efforting or over trying in the context of their business, right? So with that said, 
it's a, you know, we, we can start with the mental part um, is where am I over giving in my business mm-hmm. where I really shouldn't be. Now, I think a lot of people talk about being able to delegate tasks and being able to, to separate ourselves from being the one inside the business to the actual business owner, right? But that can be one of the, the big, big things that can start to help that process of not being in a place of resentment towards our business is identifying the place where we're over giving or doing more than we should be or need to be doing. I don't really focus on that a whole lot because I just go right to the fucking root of the problem, which gets to every area, mm-hmm. which is the reason for the overgiving or reason for the over trying in the first place. Right. Right. And so once that's been established, right, the, 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 the feeling of a lack of worthiness in some way that's caused the, the underdog mentality mm-hmm. to reveal itself uh, and thinking that I have to be an underdog to get, to get what I want and to overgive and to overproduce to, to have success. Uh, then everything resolves itself externally. So for me, it's just very much going in internally, finding the source of, of the reasoning for, for needing to overgive or needing to over to produce to think that uh, we have to do that to, to get our desired result. And as a byproduct uh, of resolving that internally, there begins to be this natural resolution that shows up externally where we just stop doing that, right? wow. which is the beautiful, beautiful part about the process. Definitely. That's, that's powerful. I, I know, um, you know, I've listened to a lot of your content um, ever since I found you. I was just super inspired. You talk a lot about living in alignment. And I know a lot of our conversation is about, about that exactly, like starting within, living in alignment. Um, is there anything else that you can touch on about that issue and how being out of alignment will impact, you know, our regular day-to-day lives? Mm, man, I think, I got living out of alignment. I mean, it shows up in uh in huge physical disorders uh that was a big thing with going super deep in internal health is uh, a lot of autoimmune conditions in particular you talk about arthritis you talk mm. about Hashimoto's you talk about psoriasis uh, IBS Crohn's mm. some of these primary autoimmune conditions stem from the inability to be able to properly express and process emotion wow so really at the end of the day it's not necessarily about alignment in itself. Now being able to resolve uh, deep rooted emotional storage is what causes alignment to be able to happen. Uh, but physical issues tend to be the most predominant thing that comes from this inability to be in this place of alignment, which is like I said, the thing, uh, which is also simultaneously the, the expression of stored emotion in mm-hmm. our bodies. Okay. Wow. So really what it all comes down to, the inability to be able to be in alignment comes from a place of uh, at one point or multiple points in our lives where we learned that whatever we wanted or the way that we were acting wasn't right and that we had to take on a different way of being and operating most of the time to be able to survive in, uh, in whatever environment that we are in. So I also want to reiterate the fact that being out of alignment and not living in a place of alignment normally comes from a place of an adaptation, uh, which many people label fears. uh, But really, I just call them adaptations because it was something that we had to take on to be able to essentially what we perceived as needing to survive at one point in our life. Mm -hmm. So we forewent our own emotional state to be able to survive or best adapt to that environment. I love that last part. I've never really looked at fears as adaptations, but now now that I think of it, that's exactly what they are. There's something that we fear, but we need to adapt in order to take on that fear at the end of the day. Right. That's amazing. That's mm-hmm. awesome. That's awesome to hear. I'm, I'm curious. I know that you're living in Rio right now. What was, what was the reasoning behind that in the first place? Was it part of like this spiritual journey that you're chasing here or was it, um, yeah. How did that come? How did that come about in the first place? Yeah. Uh, I found it interesting that you said spiritual journey that you're chasing. Uh, it, it, it it's, uh, man. Uh, but to answer your question, it was the next thing that felt really good to me. Right? Wow. And, and that's how I make most of my decisions is, does this feel inspiring? And does this feel exciting? Uh, now, depending on the season of life that I'm in, there'll also be some other indicators that determine which things I do, uh, which, which 
I, I, I have for different seasons of life, which is, which is pretty cool. But for me, I would just, I felt really pulled to it. Uh, I've been wanting to do some solo international travel mm-hmm. and uh, I was taking a month off entirely from work. So all client communication, all social media and all outside communication with anybody outside of the place that I chose to go. And uh, Brazil happened to be the place that felt the most uh, sexy, probably mm-hmm. literally and physically to me. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and I so like I, I decided to, to, to go to Rio, man. And for, from November 13th to December 26th, I, I didn't work, didn't, no client communication, no social media, and uh, was just here and fell in love with this place. Didn't speak any Portuguese, <laughs> but uh, I, I've, I've learned uh, a little bit. I'm getting a lot better and uh, just decided to stay after that one month. So I, I really meant what, what guides my decision making process is whatever feels most inspiring to me at the time. And that all, that all will essentially stem, stem from being aligned with yourself, with your emotions, correct? Knowing yourself yeah. very well. Awesome. Cool. Absolutely. And I also want to say this, a lot of the stuff that I talk about with emotions and processing emotions and going into our own emotional states, like I want to really demystify that and make it be which, what it really is, which is the next step that we have to take to get to our next level of whatever we'd like to get to in this human experience, right? So it's not like it's just this thing that we go in and we're just getting in touch with our emotions. Like literally like the church of Scientology, man, like not a lot of people know inside of what they do there. I had a client that was in the church of Scientology and he was like, dude, like there was elements of this emotional stuff that, that we did in the church of Scientology. Like he got hooked up to a machine and was going through a processing a lot of his deep rooted emotions because they needed to do that to be able to put in a different programming to be able to get the success that he wanted, right? So it's not just just me that talks about this, right? They're doing it behind the scenes at a lot of wild places. I do it in a much more uh, uh, loving, uh, compassionate way that I think leads to more more sustainability than just a a machine they're hooked up to. I think so too. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) But nevertheless, it's the next step that we have to take to be able to remove the barriers to what it is that we want. And that's how I look at it, right? It's not just like this emotional thing where people come and I'm counseling them through their emotions. No, it's something that has to happen to get to that next step. That's where a lot of people that I work with have already accomplished a lot of big things. They've done a lot of big things, right? But Mm -hmm. they no longer can personally develop their way through all of their emotional pain. Uh, They have to go in and and process it and work through it to get to that next level of success and fulfillment when they get that next level of success in their life. Wicked, wicked. Wow. Yeah, that, that was powerful. I'm, I'm curious. Now you've, you've been through a lot in your life. You know, you've, you worked towards your dreams, your dreams got crushed. You started um, a couple different careers now, and you've really found that passion for yourself. I'm curious, you know, looking back at your young self, you know, what kind of advice would you give yourself if you could change anything growing up? Yeah, I, I would, I would just say, dude, the, the battle's already won. <laughs> like oh, the, yeah. the battle's already won. Like you, you already got the juice, dude. Like you're, you got it. Like you, you don't have to like overdo it. Like you don't have to, 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 to do more. You, you, you already got it. That's how it's said. Cause I definitely, I was, dude, that, that was me. Like, dude, I worked way too hard. Like, yeah. I was from South Dakota and there's not a lot of people that, that get out of there to play in the NFL, but nevertheless, like, bro, I was a freak. Like I had a 39 inch vert white boy at 235 pounds. Like, dude, I, I like, bro, I was a beast. And I, and I worked way too hard. I yeah. wish I could have embo- embodied some of the attitude that some of the other guys that didn't work hard at all uh, embodied to be able to propel themselves to the place of the NFL. Because so much of it, what, is a belief system. Mm-hmm. Right? For me, I overworked and used this underdog ideology to motivate myself, but end up really being something where I probably got too big at one point because I kept going. Right? And, and a lot of it was lacking belief. That's why I was trying so hard. Yeah, and so absolutely. that's where this idea of, of dude, the battle's already won, uh, probably would have allowed me to be in a place where I didn't go through some of the injuries that I had, um, but also a much more seamless path to getting what to the NFL than as much work that, that I did trying to get there. Yeah, totally. That's really good. And, and, and kind of what came to my mind when we talked about that is, 
one thing that I've struggled with and a lot of people in my peer group, for example, is like being able to be, be okay with how things are going and celebrating the small wins. And when you are, you know, when you reach a goal to actually celebrate it, like I've had so much issues with that where it's like, okay, I did it On to the next one. I don't actually take a breather and just be like, holy crap, I did it. You know what I mean? And I think like mentally that, that can be draining because that's where you get into like that burnout stage and nobody likes hearing the word burnout, but it's true. Like people just, and I got this from like some of my mentors when I was back in the corporate world, but like we, you gotta be okay with like slowing down and like celebrating the wins and taking a day off. But like, I was just like work, 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 just like you were same thing, like underdog. Like I knew I was like, I knew I was capable more and I just wanted to keep on pushing. And I think a lot of young people in my generation, like Gen Z uh, millennials, there's two different groups in my personal opinion. There's, there's the ones like us that are the, the hustlers that can go and figure shit out. And then there's the people that are like the lost causes, um, the get rich quick type of a thing. But there's no, there's no like in between, in my opinion. And it's so hard to find that balance. And yeah, like that was touching definitely what you said. Yeah. Oh man. And, and, this might blow your guys' mind right here a little bit. Uh, but in regard to what you said about being able to celebrate those small victories, what yeah. I say is our, our capacity to be able to acknowledge and celebrate uh, the desirable and, and awesome things that happen in our life is only as great as our willingness to go into and feel some of our deeper hurt. So I'll let that sink in for a second. Our capacity to be able to enjoy and appreciate our victories is only as great as our willingness to go in and experience and feel some of our hurt, right? Because wow. most of the reason why you're moving forward all the time, not taking the time to slow down and acknowledge some of these things is because there's something that you don't want to feel. Mm-hmm. Right? Wow. Okay. And that something so, is, is tied to something. Is that where you're, is that where you're going? Yeah. It's always tied to something. Okay. So what we do is we go in and we find a thing or series of things that are there that you've been trying to avoid through constantly moving. (laughs) Right. Mm -hmm. We go in and we resolve that Mm -hmm. as a byproduct. You can begin to embody a lot of the the mental masturbation, you know, that good stuff of celebrate your victories and, you know, naturally, Yeah. Yeah. So for me, it's not about necessarily the concepts of doing those things, but more about, well, why are you not naturally embodying that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's crazy. (laughs) Yeah. I think it's almost like, it's almost like when you say naturally, it's almost like you're trying to, you know, you're trying to identify that root cause so that you can in a way instill or, or inhibit, um, exactly that right inhibit the fact that you want to be celebrating yourselves at a natural state because that's where it's going to be more fulfilling right as opposed to you know if you tell yourself when you get that small victory you're like celebrate that that's you know that's that's telling us that like you know obviously we're aware but um if it's not in a natural state you're almost in a way like i was saying it's it's kind of like a compliant thing you're doing it because you feel like you need to do it you know what i mean Mm -hmm. Yep. And, and, and here it is right here. Here it is. So, so if that's, if that's true. And, and also if, if this is true, that, that what I force myself to do, I don't really maybe want to do cause resentment. What is that actually going to do towards your perception of celebrating victories? It's probably going to taint it yeah. and, and make you resent it. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, so when you do begin to naturally embody it, through doing some of this work, it might make it a little more difficult for you to do because your brain's already established a negative association with it. Yeah. Wow. Holy shit. (laughs) So, so actually it's counterproductive trying to force yourself to do this. (laughs) Literally. God. I feel like, I feel like my life has just been, this is just like a, a literally a a marker moment for me. This conversation is a marker moment. I feel like I need to change so much things now. (laughs) I've just identified so many flaws in my, in my day to day. And I feel like, you know, I've, I've always felt like I've, I've always been a great uh, producer. You know, I do things, I do things well, but I feel like I'm missing a lot at the same time. And like have, after this conversation, I feel like there can be 
a lot more you know, we're 23, we're pretty young, we're very young, we've accomplished a lot in our life by all means. But after this conversation, it's almost like, what else could I have accomplished? You know what I mean? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Fuck, man. <laughs> <laughs> so awesome. So awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I think a lot of people in our audience, like we have a lot of young people in our audience, obviously, that's kind of the demographic we, we work with in specific. So like for people to hear this, this conversation is going to be very powerful before they start building these really negative habits um, and experiencing what we experience because there's the good and the bad. And, and this is definitely what, like if people can get ahead of and, and not instill those habits, because what we do now and what we've done over the past four or five years, it's so deep down there that I can only imagine there's, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to be able to bring that out and actually experience it the way that, you know, we talked about in this conversation from within, um, from a sense where we're like, okay, like this is how it should be done. I'm on my own accord. It's going to be a hard shift. <laughs> <laughs> I love it though. Yeah. Yeah. Not, 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 not for me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I can, we can make, I can make that transition very quick, but I, I want to say this though. I agree a hundred percent with the younger generation hearing this because yeah. mark my words, mark my words in 10 years. Okay. 10 years. Everything else is going to be obsolete. All other personal development stuff. And this is going to be everything. Oh yeah. Very new. Very new. But I'm at at the forefront of this. It's kind of like Bitcoin 10 years ago. Yeah. (laughs) Bitcoin's hot today, boys. That thing's popping off, right? (laughs) (laughs) Literally. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. This this is that right here. Okay. So, so for young people to, to hear this, man, and I'm only 27 too, so I'm not too far off, but you know, for, for younger people to hear this and, and to, to learn and know the truth about a lot of this, um, it's everything. Uh, and I also want to say this is that it is a very healthy step in the process of learning how to become disciplined known as well. Mm. I want to add that. So that's where I say a lot of this can be the next step after there's been some element of what some people might call self-mastery in that mm-hmm. way. Right. Cool. This is just the next step. Yeah, right. but if yeah. you're if you're jumping trying to get off the couch and make things happen with your life, um, they would maybe wouldn't be ready for me. But I would say establish a certain form of, of discipline in some way in your in your life through routine, mm-hmm. right, and through being able to create some consistency. Okay, this is just the next step. Got it. Love cool. that. Love that. Awesome. This conversation has went just about everywhere. But to wrap things up, the way that we always like to to finish off here. Um, is, is advice, basically advice for the younger self, uh, younger people. Um, so people who are chasing their dreams, have the ambition, they want to get started. Uh, what's like the biggest piece of advice you can give to somebody, um, that is wanting to get on that journey, but just doesn't know where to go. Mm, Absolutely. Uh, what I would say, and this is probably the the best advice that I can give is, and I think the first part's relatively cliche, but the second might not be, uh, find someone that is doing what you want to do at a very high capacity and hire them as your mentor. Okay. Second part of that is find someone that knows how to do deep energetic work as myself and hire them as well. Right. So it's important to have one person to show you how to do the thing that you want to learn how to do. Mm -hmm. Second to remove the things and the energy that's causing you not to be able to be super successful in that space. Right. Those are the two most important things that I would say for any, any young person uh, to be able to do. I'm very fortunate to have both in one with my coach, which is awesome. All right. And if people can get that awesome, if you're, obviously if you're in my space, then that's great. But if you're not a mentor and somebody that can help uh, remove yeah. a lot of those adaptations, fears right, that are limiting you from being able to have all the success that you want. <clears throat> that. Cause a men- mentor is not going to do that. <laughs> definitely. Definitely. I love that. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, I, I want to touch on that real quick. I'm a, I, I totally agree with that. 110%, especially the, the, the second portion, I feel like Eric and I are lacking 100%, but the first portion, um, having a mentor, you know, following someone's framework all said and done and, and essentially just collaborating and, and partnering with that person, it's only going to cause more accelerated growth at the end of the day, right? You're not, you're going to mitigate a lot of mistakes. You're going to learn at a, at a higher rate. Um, and things are just probably going to go more smooth rather than you trying to figure it out yourself and therefore waste probably a lot of time. You're probably going to waste a lot of money in doing that and a lot more soul searching, so to speak. So 
Um, love that advice, man. I, I appreciate you hopping on the call. It was freaking phenomenal. Easily like the best conversation that I've had all year, even last year, like crazy good. Yeah. Um, yeah, man, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm really glad I got to hop on and, and have this conversation with you guys too. So thanks for creating the space. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. Appreciate it.